Well, good evening, everyone. I want to introduce myself first. My name is Brian Beathy. I'm the president and CEO of Grimes Chamber and Economic Development. And um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to everybody for coming out here this evening. Um, it's our opening statements won't start here for a few minutes, but I wanted a chance to kind of talk to everybody, welcome you, um, thank you for being here, and thank you really um, for taking the time to come out to an event like this where you can become a more informed citizen. Um, I wish more people um, would come out to things like this and really educate themselves before we got to the ballot box. Um, I think a lot of people, it's good that everybody votes, right? We always encourage that, but we really like it when people take the time to know what the issues are, know what's important to them, research, <laughs> know who they're voting for. Um, we have two very fine candidates with us this evening. Um, thank you for being here, Jake. Thank you for being here, Karen. And um, we look forward to learning more about each of you here this evening. Um, this is something, I've been in Grimes now in this position for roughly a little over 11 years now. And um, this is an event that's hosted by Grimes Chamber and Economic Development and the Johnston Chamber of Commerce, or JEDCO, I suppose, is involved too. And so you're going to see a lot of the questions out of the gate are ones that we've come up through our membership, um, stuff that's very important to us. They're going to revolve around economic development or sit community development, um, and things that our members have told us that are important to them. We're going to work our way through them first. And then at the end, near the end of the session, we're going to take some of the questions that you guys have put in. This doesn't mean that you can't ask questions after the event or send emails back and forth to the candidates and try and get um, questions answered that way. Um, I just kind of want to set the stage for what you might expect to see here this evening. Um, how many members does the Johnston Chamber of Commerce have? 245. 245 members. Grimes is set somewhere in like 290 members. So, and some of those are crossover. We have businesses that belong to both of our organizations. Um, but there's a lot of businesses around here, and um, and that's who we get to work with day in and day out. Um, some of the questions were provided to the candidates in advance so they could kind of research and, and give you well thought out answers. Um, our goal here isn't to put them on the spot and and catch them with their guard down we want. Um, just like um, whoever is elected to this position, hopefully when they get up on the hill down in Des Moines, they'll um, thoroughly research things, listen to opinions, and uh, make a decision based on what they're able to learn. That's what we want to do as voters too. So, um, I also want to point out that we do expect, we've got a history, and I was just discussing this with Phil Dunshee, my counterpart, over in Johnston of having very civil discussions of these things and, and we'd hope that everybody would cooperate on that. Um, we want to hear from both of these candidates and um, we just ask for your cooperation in that. Um, we want to thank the candidates too because running for public office is not for the faint of heart. Um, it comes with a certain level of criticism. What, No matter which side of the aisle you sit on, um, somebody's going to disagree with your opinions on things. So um, we respect that they're willing to come out here in a public forum like this and talk about what they believe, knowing that some will agree and some will disagree. Um, so thank you um, for being willing to do that. Very much appreciated. Um, we have a kind of anticipated order, order of events this evening. We're going to start with some opening and closing statements. And we're going to start with opening statements, and we're going to end with closing statements, and in between there's going to be a lot of questions. I guess we could go straight to closing statements and wrap this baby up, but um, that's not the goal here. So, uh, do either one of you have any questions before we begin? Okay, well then let me remind the audience that um, early voting has started, so if you're registered, um, you can go and vote right now if you want. Um, if you're not registered, go get registered, and then you can vote after you're registered. Um, but election day, if you're like me and you just like the, the pomp and circumstance of going and voting on election day, is scheduled to be on Tuesday, November 6th this year. So do a little research in advance if you don't know and find out where your polling place is, and be sure to make it down there on election day if you don't cast an early ballot. Um, 
I think I'm about talked out right now, and you guys didn't come here. To, you guys didn't come here to hear from me anyway. Um, I do want to say thank you to the staff that helped us prepare for this today. Thank you for, to the City of Grimes for letting us use this banquet hall space um, that we do a lot of things in over the course of the year. And without further ado, we talked to the candidates in advance, and Karen has agreed um, to begin with her opening statement first. Karen. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, thank you to the Chambers. Thank you to Johnston Economic Development Corporation. I am delighted to be here this evening. Um, I'm Karen Derry, and I'm running for the Iowa House of Representatives, District 39. That's Johnston and Grimes, uh, Precinct 4 in Urbandale, and Jefferson Township. And I am a first-time candidate, um, so many of you may not know a whole lot about me. Uh, my husband, Jeff, and I have been married for 21 years. Uh, we've lived in Johnson for the last 19 years. Jeff is a mailman. Uh, he's with the U.S. Postal Service. He has been for 25 years. We have three children, David, Joseph, and Carlene. I have had a child in the Johnson School District since 1994. Uh, and I've been advised by the school board members there that that doesn't even come close to a record. So. <laughs> I am in Iowa now, but I recognize that by Iowa standards, I'm still a newcomer. I've only been here for 39 years. Uh, when I was 16 years old, my parents and I uh, moved from Minnesota to Conrad, Iowa, where my dad had been hired to uh, run a new company. Today, we'd probably call it a startup. My parents worked very hard. Eventually, they became the owners of that business, which they operated for over 20 years. I graduated from the University of Iowa. And after college, I worked in human resources for over 15 years. In 1997, I uh, received a bachelor's degree in public administration. But you know, I always kind of dreamt about going back full time so I could become a lawyer. And then in 2004, thanks to a very patient and supportive husband, I started at Drake Law School. At the time, I was 41 years old. We had three kids at home. The youngest was two. Two and a half years later, I graduated with highest honors, passed the bar, and fulfilled my dream to become a lawyer. Uh, after I graduated from law school, I clerked for Justice David Baker on the Iowa Supreme Court. And after that, I was with the Whitfield and Eddie Law Firm for a few years. Then I prosecuted dependent adult abuse cases for the state of Iowa. And then from uh, 2011 until earlier this year, I was in-house counsel for DHI Grobe um, in Urbandale. Um, you know, I've done a lot of different things with my career, and I think that, you know, my experience um, doing a number of different things, as well as my having lived in the district for the last 19 years, and having had a family in the district during that time, uh, will serve me well in the Iowa legislature. So, thank you for being here. Um, I'm excited to answer your questions, and um, I hope that you'll decide to vote for me this November. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for being here as well. Thank you, Kelsey, Ryan, and everybody else, and Phil, working through this. I appreciate it. I'm running for office for the same reason I ran for office six years ago. I feel passion for my community. I love my community. I've been here since 2001. I think it's the best place to work, raise a family, and make a great living. A lot of my friends have left. A lot of my friends have moved to uh, Twin Cities, Kansas City, Chicago, all over. I want to make sure this is the best place to stay. Make sure to stay right here in Iowa. That's been a big problem we've had for a long time. That's why I'm running. I think we need young people the legislator to make sure that we are keeping the state in the right direction. Uh, over the last six years, I've done a lot for open, transparent government. And we moving forward, we keep doing that. I was a chair of local government for the last two years. Just about every bill I did was about open, transparent government, being more accountable to the people. So moving forward, I want to make sure that we can continue that path moving forward. Happy to answer any questions, and thanks again for having me. I appreciate it. Since Karen, you did open with opening statements, the first question is going to go over to Jake then. Um, so, are you prepared to begin? Sure. <laughs> All right. Um, in the past several years, Grimes and Johnson have used tax increment financing as a local match for state incentives from the Iowa Economic Development Authority and 
the Department of Transportation in support of significant expansions, including Corteva, Happy Smiles Technology Incorporated, um, John Deere Financial, um, for a few examples. Tax increment finance is also been used to support other business development activities on Merle Hay Road, South James Street, Jan Grimes, Southeast Gateway Drive, East First Street, 86th Street, and in other areas. Hopefully you know where all those spots are at. We kind of bounce around two communities, a lot of different street names. Do you support the retention of tax increment finance <laughs> as a means for supporting business, commercial, multifamily residential development, and will you help prevent, le prevent legislation that would reduce the effectiveness of tax increment finance or make it more difficult to use? Long questions. Thank you. Um, actually, I have in the past uh, stopped any bill moving forward from uh, reducing TIF. I think TIF is a tool in the local developments and local city councils and local administrators' tool bill. They need to make sure that they use it responsibly moving forward, but as of right now, we have not uh, seen a lot of abuse in our communities. Yes, there are communities that abuse it, Corville being the poster child for that, but moving forward, uh, we need to make sure that people are using responsible, and I've seen, I've seen numerous bills, but nothing has really ever moved over the last six years. One thing we need to be cognizant of, uh, make sure that we're not taking advantage of, is that every time a local community tips a project, the state taxpayer has to backfill the entire thing. Um, that just topped $69 million last year. That's more than double in less than 10 years. Obviously, we're not going to shortchange our kids by not allowing that money to go to the school. So we just need to be cognizant or uh, make sure we're aware of that moving forward, all the projects going forward. That's my only concern with it right now. But as we have, uh, I support as it is. Thank you. Karen? Thank you. Um, you know, one of the things that I have done since I decided to run for uh, the legislature is I've spoken with a lot of different people in a lot of different areas. So, you know, I'm not an expert in law enforcement, so I've spoken with people in law enforcement or in healthcare, so I've spoken with people in healthcare. Uh, I have had several conversations with uh, city leaders, and uh, based upon those conversations, I understand that TIF is a very important tool for economic development in this district, and therefore I do support TIF as well. Uh, I do think, though, that we do need to keep an eye on you know, any kind of program and make sure that it is accomplishing the purposes that we want it to. One of your questions was whether we would ever um, do anything to reduce the effectiveness or if I would support anything to reduce the effectiveness of TIF. And I, I don't think most legislators, you know, Republican or Democrat, uh, intend to do things to reduce the effectiveness of any, um, any um, public program, um, at least not knowingly. And I think that's why it's really important for legislators to, you know, speak with experts in that er in different areas, have relationships with experts in different areas. So what I would do if um, an issue with TIF came up is I'd probably go ahead and give a call to some of the people who I've met, um, you know, reaching out to city leaders and ask them. I'd say, you know, this is what's proposed. Uh, what do you think? You know, how do you think this will impact the district? Uh, because I think it's really important that. You know, we we get ex we we seek expertise, and um, also that you know the the different levels of government work together as much as possible. Thank you, Karen. All right, question number two, and I'm going to come right back to you. Um, several years ago, the legislature approved legislation that provides for a property tax rollback for commercial properties, if elected. What would your position be with respect to the so-called backfill funding for local governments? And what are your perspectives about increased valuation and assessments being applied to commercial property by county and city assessors? Thank you again. Uh, yeah, earlier this year, the legislature did seriously look at um, uh, reducing the backfill or eliminating it. They did not do it this year. And for those of you who may not be familiar with the backfill, uh, basically in 2013, the legislature uh, passed a commercial property tax uh, reduction and um, promised you know, local governments that any reduction in the revenues uh, due to that uh, reduction that they passed, um, any reduction in revenues to these local governments would be backfilled by the state. 
Uh, you know, now that um, you know this budget is tighter, uh, there's a concern and with continuing with that backfill and uh, perhaps eliminating it. You know, when I go door to door uh, and talk with voters, I hear from a lot of voters a lot of concern about the amount of money that they spend in property tax. And I, you know, I, I think that's a fair concern. I mean, people in this district spend a lot of money on taxes, and we have every right to be concerned about spending um, too much, about our taxes increasing, and about um, you know how that money is spent. Is it, is it, you know, is it being wasted? Are we being as cautious with it as we possibly can? Uh, so one of my concerns with um, eliminating the backfill would be that you know would it result in increased property taxes for for residents? And I, I think that that is very concerning for um, district voters. Uh, the other concern I have, and this is more based upon the conversations that I've had with city leaders, is you know I've come to understand that if the uh, backfill were just taken away with really no opportunity to plan, that would really be devastating for uh, some of these local governments. So, you know, at a minimum, if we're going to be looking at, you know, a reduction of the backfill, you know, I would advocate um, strongly for making sure that it's not, the, you know, local governments had adequate time to plan around it, and that it's not something that would um, happen overnight. Um, it would need to happen incrementally. Thank you, Brian. Uh, the back bill was first enacted after the re rolled back commercial property evaluation in 2010, or excuse me, 2013. Uh, right now, the, when we first passed that bill, we wanted to make sure that the communities had enough time to grow out of it, and they did. Uh, Johnston alone had 130% valuation in less than three years. Grimes, I checked it earlier today, was at 121% growth. Uh, I can't remember urban off the top of my head, but I have the sheet on my phone somewhere. I'll find it for you guys later. Uh, the whole point was to grow, to grow our way out of the gut, and we have done that, especially around here. 97 of Iowa's 99 counties have significant growth, over the over 110% growth of the communities. Um, I would support a reasonable phase-out of the backfill. Um, the bill we had out of appropriations that never moved, we had a subcommittee on, was seven years um, phase-out, and also making sure that the communities that are most affected by it still had um, enough to move forward. When it comes to the assessment, I have been working on this issue for a couple of years now. I just had lunch with Randy, who's our uh, assessment. You don't want to mess with the actual valuation of how they determine the real value of a property. It's not their fault um, that we're growing by 20% and our people want to live in our community and our community is growing and everything else is going up. It is a problem when the letter rate stays the same. The bigger problem is when you grow by 20% moving forward, 20% when you keep the library the same, automatically grows up more and more property taxes that you pay. So that's something we need to look at. Also, we did an assessment board last year that makes it easier for people to fight their assessments, makes it easier for them to make sure that they have a say in the game when they're fighting their assessment. So we're going to continue to look at that issue, and I think property taxes and a cut projects is my number one issue next year. Thank you. All right, Jake, we're coming back to you with this question. The region has recently pushed out an ambitious plan that brings public and private partners together for a regional water trails project. It's, this includes projects in the Johnston area. What is your position and on finding a permanent and dedicated source of funding for recreational water quality projects throughout the state of Iowa? Thank you again, Brian. Uh, I believe you're, you're getting at IWILL here. You want to talk about IWILL and two funds we have. One's RIF funding we have. Um, RIF funding is Rebuild Iowa Infrastructure Fund. It all comes from gambling revenue. It was about $300 million last year. In, in that bill, we actually put a uh, amount for trails and dams and everything else in there. There is a state component to that, but I also believe there's a local component to this. The trails in the community, the, community, the city councils of the local area, Polk County, can also work on that as well. I think there's a big part of local control on this issue how they want to approach it. Um, also, to the question about IWILL, IWILL has, I believe the funding right now is 90% to water quality, and about 10%, and the voters put that in the Constitution in 2010. I can only support IWILL if there is a corresponding tax decrease, but moving forward, I think there's been some great bills pushed forward by IWILL that would have significant impact about help with income tax in the state of Iowa decrease, also, and fund the services that we need with IWILL with water quality and different trails around the state. Thank you. Karen? 
Thanks, Brian. Yeah, of course it would be wonderful to see the Regional Trails project be a success. Um, it sounds like there's a lot of support in the business community. Is this working? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Sounds like there's a lot of support in the business community for it. Um, and of course with the component in Johnson, that would be good for economic development for our district. Uh, you know, as far as finding a long-term funding source for it, um, you know, I think that's something that we'd have to look at very carefully. Um, I don't know if you're thinking about some sort of a public-private partnership to um, to do that. That's something that you know perhaps we could look at. Um, I am a little bit concerned uh, when we talk about um, finding additional funding for different projects, given where we're at with the budget. Um, you know, the DNR budget, the Department of Natural Resources budget, has been cut basically in half since 2005. So, um, you know, it's gone from $22 million to $11 million. Uh, you know, we have our state parks that aren't clean, uh, you know, not fully staffed, and, and that's presented some problems for, um, you know, people just wanting to enjoy our state parks. So that would be part of my concern with uh, moving forward with the Water Trails project. All right, Darren, this question comes back to you first. Um, legislators belong to political parties and are members of a political caucus while serving at the state capitol. It seems that we live in an era of extreme partisanship. If elected, how would you behave as a state representative? How will you work with other legislators, including legislators from different parties and regions, to build consensus and make decisions on important issues? How would you describe your style as a legislator? Thank you, Brian. Um, you know, I agree that we've become just entirely too partisan in this state. And I will tell you that when I'm, I am out talking with um, people, uh, voters at the door, I hear about it a lot. People are tired of our legislators putting um, party before uh, people and, you know, simply just not working together in order to move our state forward. Um, you know, I am a Democrat. I've been a Democrat since I was old enough to vote. Uh, but I refuse to demonize all Republicans. We've had some wonderful Republican leaders um, in this state, in this country. Um, and, you know, I was, my parents were Republicans. They were good, compassionate, hardworking people. Uh, what I want to do is I want to work together with independents, Democrats, Republicans in order to move the state forward. So how do we do that? Uh, I mentioned I'd spent seven years as in-house counsel for DHI group, and I spent most of that time, frankly, you know, uh, negotiating contracts uh, with other parties. So you know, whether we were going to lease some space or we were going to uh, buy something or, or sell something, um, you know, we'd, we'd have this other party, and we wanted to get the deal done. That was the goal. But we might have very different ideas about how we'd go about that. So I'd be advocating for my client. Representatives for the other party would be advocating for their client. Um, we'd communicate, we'd negotiate, we'd compromise, and we'd figure out a way to get the deal done. Um, I think that's what we need to be doing um, in the legislature as well. You know, in real life, we so rarely get our way all the time. You know, negotiating contracts with other parties, Generally, you know, neither party got their way. Everyone had to compromise. But at the end of the day, we got the deal done. And that's what both parties wanted more than necessarily having their way completely. Um, so those, I, that's the kind of thing that I think we need to be doing at the legislature. And I really appreciate the chamber asking this question because it is really an important issue. And, you know, frankly, one of the reasons that I decided to run for office because along with the um, voters who I'm talking with at the doors, I'm a little tired of it as well. I want everybody to know that this is Iowa, this is not D.C. Um, we get along very well with the Capitol. 88% of bills that pass the legislature pass in a bipartisan manner. Over 80% of bills passed, passed with over 90 votes out of 100. Um, it's a, in the last six years I've been there. We get along pretty well. I have a very proud independent street of working with both parties. For to name a few, we worked on water quality together. Um, we made, Voted with a lot of Democrats on that issue, but moving forward, we've got to continue to do that streak. Um, as a committee chair, I tried to I broke precedent for the first time in a very long time. I guess I did not know this rule, uh, but before you were not allowed to hand bills off to the minority party, which made no sense to me. And so this year, I actually handed bills off to the minority party, and I was 
asked, well, you're not supposed to do that. And I'm like, what do you mean? They wrote the bill, it's a good bill, let's move forward. So we ended up moving bills out of the chamber, ran by the opposite minority party, and I was the committee chair, which is probably the first time it's happened in my six years. I didn't know that was actually a rule until I got there. Um, and both parties do it, and it's sad, but for the most part, we get along pretty well, and most bills we come out of committee were great to work on with both, both sides. So we'll continue working that uh, bipartisan manner. Thank you. Okay, Jake. In the gubernatorial campaigns, there has been discussion about incentives that have been used to attract corporate investment in our communities and region. Some have suggested economic development tools like the research activities credit, innovation tax credit, be reduced or eliminated. We know that incentives like these, along with high quality jobs program, help keep hundreds of high quality research jobs at Pioneer in Corteva. These tools have also been used to support business growth at John Deere Financial and many other businesses in Central Iowa. Like it or not, we are in competition with other regions who also provide these incentives. What is your position with respect to the need for economic development tools to help grow our economy? Thank you. Um, well, as first of all, I'll say, in a perfect world, we would not need these incentives. We would not need anything to bring companies here. But we don't live in a perfect world. Um, I think every right now we have the R and D tax credit, which is very popular in our district with Pioneer, John Deere, everybody else here. We have tightened that down a little bit to make sure the proper companies are getting it. But also moving forward, I want people. This new conversation about tax credits has been popping up over the last year, and it's kind of interesting to me. Um, so I printed off the tax credits that we have in the state. And the biggest tax credit we have is the Earned Income Tax Credit. The second biggest one is the Iowa Industrial New Jobs Training Program. Um, these are tax credits that are pretty popular by both parties. And all these tax credits have passed almost unanimously over the last six years. And moving forward, I want to make sure that we still have some form of it, some form of incentives here. We need to take a look at every single one of them to make sure that they are working. If they're not working, we need to get rid of them. There should be no shame in looking at every single thing in our budget and make sure it's working. Uh, some of the things we can do is work with corporate income, corporate uh, tax rate. If we can lower the corporate tax rate, maybe, or have a neutral uh, tax neutral, excuse me, tax neutral policy, maybe we can eliminate some of these. But as of right now, if we're going to compete for jobs, we have to make sure we have a, a good playing field. Thank you, Jake. Karen. Thank you. Uh, before I answer that question, I do want to respond to one thing that Representative um, Highfield mentioned about the parties getting along at the State House uh, these last couple of years uh, and working together in a bipartisan manner. Um, you know, my understanding, and I spent quite a bit of time at the State House um, this last year, uh, was that the uh, minority party was shut out of an awful lot of conversations, and um, you know. I appreciate very much, Representative Highfield, your efforts to work in a bipartisan manner, and I think that that's commendable, the, the work that you know you said that you've done to move that forward. Um, but I will say that I don't think that that's the public's view of uh, what happened in the State House these last two years, and I don't think it's um, many of the minority party um, uh, legislators' view either that that's the way uh, it went these last couple of, uh, of years. So. In terms of tax incentives for, for business, um, you know, you use the language like it or not, and I think that that's, you know, pretty descriptive. Um, you know, I'm not naive. I understand that um, in order to attract businesses and employers to the district, sometimes those tax incentives, you know, are, are required. And, and of course, we want uh, good employers in the district and in the state, um, you know, employers that are providing good paying jobs, um, the kinds of jobs that allow people to, um, you know, save for retirement, own a home, um, save for their kids' college. Uh, so we want to support that. But I agree with Representative Highfield that these things need to be kept a close eye on. Um, you know, the tax credits since uh, 2005 have gone from 153 million to an expected 427 million for this year. Now that's a big chunk out of uh, uh, Iowa state budget. So of course we need to keep an eye on those things. Um, I've heard a few different uh, proposals that I think make some sense. Uh, reviewing periodically, um, I think is something that we should consider doing. And um, we want to make sure that you know what we're doing with these tax uh, credits are incentivizing the things that, that we want them to incentivize. So again, things like creating good paying jobs, uh, things that help our environment uh, are the kinds of things that
that we want to make sure that you know we're providing for. Um, you know, a couple of other things that I think that are worthy of review is the whole idea of uh, refundability. Um, you know, there are uh, companies that don't pay any state income tax that are still getting these state tax credits, and I'd like to take a, a closer look at that, and also consideration of putting some caps on some of the credits. Thank you. Okay, Karen. Next question coming back to you. Many business many businesses indicate that the competition for highly educated and skilled workers is limiting their ability to grow in Iowa. What initiatives or policies would you support that can help create, retain, and recruit a strong workforce for our economy both now and into the future? Thank you. Uh, yeah, this is an issue that's very near and dear to my heart. Having worked in human resources for over 15 years, I understand uh, that if an employer can't find qualified uh, employees, they're in a world of hurt. That's a big problem uh, for them. So we do need to be doing everything that we can to make sure that uh, businesses have um, access to uh, qualified employees. It's one of the major reasons I'm such a big advocate for uh, adequately funding our public schools, making sure that our community colleges are uh, funded and our regents universities are, are funded as well. You know, another way to look at this is when we're looking at you know trying to attract uh, people to the state or encourage um, young people to stay in the state of Iowa. You know, I, I remember working in HR and, you know, one of the things we could use to attract people to the state was the idea that, you know, if you lived in Iowa, you can send your kids to public schools and they're going to get a good education. And then when they graduate, they're going to be able to attend a world-class public university and it will be affordable. And those are very important retention, or I'm sorry, recruitment tools that employers in Iowa can use to, um, to attract employees. So I think that this question just completely speaks to the importance of making sure that we are adequately funding uh, education at the K-12 level as well as our public colleges. Just about every year and it's one of the very difficult things we have to do because it is almost impossible to predict the jobs of the future every year you can come and have a great proposal with community colleges which we work with the community colleges every year we have future ready Iowa we passed the bipartisan 990 out of the house passed unanimous out of the Senate it was a governor's proposal two years ago we had jobs ready training we work, work with the trade unions and also ABC which is right here in our district and we'll try to get together for jobs that uh, are skilled. They're not college-bound jobs. We work really close with that. And I'll t uh, tell you, it is still very difficult to predict the market in the future, What what's the need moving forward. Example, nursing is extremely uh, in need right now. Uh, with skilled workforce labor when it comes to uh, welding or different projects like that. So we make sure those are things we're working on. Um, we work with employers. We've had commissions and task force that work with their employers and ask them what their needs are moving forward. So we're going to continue to work on that. It's a never-ending job, never-ending task as we continue to work on that. Thank you, Jake. All right. Water quality has been an important... That's good you're taking a drink of water. As I asked <laughs> water quality has been an important topic of discussion in Iowa for many years. The state addressed this issue last year to an extent. In your opinion, has enough been done? And if not, what more do you feel should be done? Oh boy, this consumed my life for about six months. I can't think of a bigger sham than that water quality bill that passed. Um, I voted no. I was a proud, proud no vote. And uh, I will tell you, I think it did not go far enough. I think the, our water's moving forward are one of the most important things we can do. Hijacking more RIF funding, which we've been using the RIF funding for our, our universities and our regions, which have got a large majority of that moving forward. Taking more money from there is not the answer to how to fix water quality. I think it was a horrible bill. There was no accountability in the bill. Um, basically, just give me money and we'll promise you results later on. That's not how we do things. If we are going to give money, we have to have results and have measures and standards moving forward. 
It is we nitrate standards and everything else moving forward. And this is not a sustainable solution moving forward. I I thought we had the bill killed. And I thought we were really close. We passed 5149. We had about <coughs> eight House Republicans vote no, um, ended up passing. But I wish we could have stopped it. I worked really, really hard with both parties trying to stop this bad bill. I think we can do better. The one thing about this is when you when you pass a bill, and this is just politics in general, you get the check mark. Oh, we, we did water quality. Well, no one really knows what that means because it's a huge, complex issue. I think it's a sham that we did that. I think we should make sure go back and re, re look at the issue moving forward. Thank you, Jay. Karen. Thank you. Uh, and I also uh, do not believe that the water quality bill uh, that was passed um, was in any way adequate for many of the same reasons that Representative Highfill has has just spoken about, so I won't go into them. Um, you know, clearly it's not adequately funded. There's $4 million that were um, allocated for water quality uh, this year, and you know, $4 million is a lot of money, of course, but water quality is a huge issue, and um, that's you know not anywhere clear near um, enough to address this important issue. Uh, you know, our state budget is a reflection of our priorities, and you know I think the fact that you know we're not um, adequately uh, addressing this is is a reflection of the legislature's priorities these last few years, and I think it's a shame. Uh, I do support the increase of the three A's uh, cent sales tax. Uh, in order to take that money and um, start moving toward a comprehensive plan to improve water quality in this state. Uh, I think it's something that we, you know, need to do. Um, you know, I, of course I'm concerned with raising taxes. Everybody always is, as well we should be. Um, but this is a big issue and we need to um, have the funds available so we can start working on this now. Johnston and Grimes pride themselves on having very well-respected local school districts. The communities regular are asked to support local bond initiatives to build, expand, or remodel facilities, which typically pass in our communities. What should the state's role be in helping to support and improve education for the children of our district? Thank you. Uh, first, I agree that uh, we do have outstanding public schools in our district. You know, I moved to the district for the good public schools, uh, people who I meet, um, you know, uh, uh, talking with voters, many of them have come to the district for our good public schools. I mentioned I've had a child in the Johnson Public Schools since 1994. Um, both my <clears throat> sons have graduated from Johnston. Our uh, youngest, uh, Carlene, is a junior at Johnston High School this year. My kids have had just a great experience with the public schools in Iowa, and that's one of the reasons I decided to run. As I watched uh, what was happening with the funding of our public schools, I became very concerned that you know future generations coming along weren't going to have that same good public school um, experience that my kids have enjoyed. Just this last year, um, the public schools received a 1.1% increase. Uh, that doesn't even keep up with inflation. Uh, so I'm very worried uh, that we're starving our public schools and that that's going to end up causing big problems for the state moving on. You know, in terms of the relationship with the um, state, um, you know, I am a big believer in local control. I know there's a lot of business people uh, here today, and, and you're probably all familiar with that concept of making sure that, you know, you're empowering your employees to make decisions uh, as close to the issue as possible. So, for example, you're empowering employees who work with customers to uh, resolve customer uh, issues. It's the same kind of concept here. You know, the local school boards are the are the people who are closest to the issues in the individual communities. So I prefer to see the state, um, you know, allow local school boards to have just as much control um, as they can. I think that's important. They know best. Thank you, Karen. Jake? I would 100% agree with that local control, and that's why I was the lone sponsor for the Home Rule Bill for schools here in Iowa. Um, right now, our schools have been under Dillon's Law, which means that you cannot do anything without asking permission from the state government. I was the lone sponsor of the bill. We ended up getting passed this year, and uh, sadly, sadly, it was a partisan bill. Um, so now schools have Home Rule moving forward. 
And I also agree that school boards know best. So a couple things we did for school board elections was I moved school board elections. I ran the bill from September to November. One of the big reasons I did that was voter turnout. September, in September elections, was about 8% turnout. In November, it was about 23% turnout. Hopefully, let's get more people uh, involved in the polls and know what's going on. And I, I, I feel with my school board members because the only time you ever contact the school board members is when they're mad at the school board members about who's moving a bus route or something like that. So that's kind of frustrating. I, and I understand that. So that's why I did that. I also passed a bill my second year to have all school board officials required to have cell phone, or excuse me, phone and email on their website. That was a big bill I moved my second year. Um, I also voted for SAVE this year. SAVE extension passed the Iowa House 95 to 3. And I believe that's one of the most important issues moving forward for our schools. Only three states in the country have increased school K through <laughs> education more than Iowa has. That's according to the Seattle's Gazette and Des Moines Register. Uh, KCCI did a study a couple months ago, and they even said we said we're far surpassing all of our neighbors moving forward, and they're happy with a, a doubling inflation over the last couple of years. Um, I also worked on suicide prevention in the state, which will help hopefully save a couple lives. That was a bill I've been working on for a couple of years now. We finally got it done this year. It took way too long to get it done. That was a very important bill. School safety as well. We worked on a bill to require um, in our uh, school boards to have an emergency plan in case of a school shooting. That horrible, horrible thing that ever happens in the state of Iowa. And moving back, where we talked to FEMA, we talked to emergency management, we talked to Camp Dodge, and they're helping out with a lot of these plans as it comes back. And on your question, you had a question about bonds and uh, bonds here. I have not personally gotten involved with bonds here. I think it's a local issue. People have asked me um, help or stop one, I just try to stay out of those as much as I possibly can. Jake. All right. Both Johnston and Grimes have received the designation of being a home base Iowa community, which is a program that was established to help the state recruit, recruit those leaving military service to consider moving here, being part of our local workforce and our communities. Do you support the premise of this initiative, and is there more work to be done on this front at the state level? Absolutely, I voted for it. It was 98 to 1. There's only one no vote out of the House. It passed unanimous out of the Senate and signed by Governor Branstead. Um, I was actually at the ribbon cutting for, I believe, both of them, and uh, it was a great time. We have to keep keep recruiting these great, talented people here in our communities. With Camp Dodge and the base we have here, I think it's just wonderful that they're here. A couple things we've done. There's a committee out there reviewing. We can do more. Um, licensing compacts is a big one. So a lot of these people that are well trained in the military get nursing or emergency training. Well, they're messing with their licensing boards and how they get their licensing. So moving forward, we're going to have a, a commission and try to figure out how we can make it easier for them to transfer right into the skills they, they learn in the Army or military and just have a job right here in Iowa. That's going to be a bipartisan bill, no doubt about that. Um, also, we were able, this year, the Senators on and I were able to keep the police academy right here at Camp Dodge. That was, a big, that was a big fight. They wanted to move to Newton, but I believe keeping that here allows us to uh, save resources and work alongside um, our local, excuse me, work with Camp Dodge and Police Academy to keep it right here and save resources as we move forward. So happy to support it and looking for more uh, recommendations as they come back with their committee. <laughs> Thank you, Jake. Karen? Thank you so much, and, and, and thank you, uh, Mr. Heifel, for telling us that the vote went 99 to 1 on that, because as I read that question in the description of the program, I thought, well, now, who wouldn't agree with that? It seems like a pretty good idea. Uh, we're supporting the people who have uh, served our country and uh, helping to match them up with uh, employers who need those skills. So, um, you know, of, of course, I'd support uh, something like that. Um, you know, and I just, you know, as I looked at that, it, it occurred to me that this is such a good example of good government. You know, so often we talk about, um, or we hear about, you know, people talking about small government and, you know, even making comments that, that, that almost make you think that they believe that, um, you know, government's just a necessary evil and, um, you know, there's, there's not much value to it. And, you know, I disagree with that bill, or with that view. I think that, um, you know, government can play a very important role in people's lives, certainly in terms of providing, you know, here in Iowa, good public schools and, um, you know, infrastructure and roads and public safety. Um, so, you know, I, 
I just want to make sure that everyone understands that I think there's a lot of value to government. This is another example uh, where you know uh, people have have you know used a government program to really improve people's lives, and you know I'm I'm all for it. Thank you, Karen. All right, I'll get back to you now. The opioid epidemic is something that has not only impacted our nation, but is also a very real thing in our region and in our local communities. Are there any statewide policies or initiatives that should be further enacted to help prevent addiction and improve access to effective treatment for those who have become addicted? Thank you, um, and I appreciate you bringing up this issue as well because it is such an important issue. You know, unfortunately, you know, the opioid crisis has hit Iowa just like it has so many other states across this country. Um, and, you know, of course, what a shame. You know, we should continue to be looking at ways that we can help to, um, you know, reduce the impact of the crisis. Uh, there's a number of different, you know, um, Things that people have looked at, such as increased use of Narcan, um, and I, I, I think we need to continue to look at that, look at how other states are addressing it, and find out what's the best way for us to, um, you know, address this issue. Another component of it, I think, is making sure that we um, have adequate mental health um, options available for uh, people in the state. So, um, yes, of course, we need to we need to be looking at other options. Um, you know, another thing I would say about this that I'd like to see us continue to uh, explore is, um, you know, to increase um, or continue to look at the use of medical marijuana. Um, I, you know, I've heard um, people talk before about, um, you know, how if, if, if there were increased use of that, perhaps that could help somewhat with the opioid crisis. I think we should continue to explore that. I believe last year the legislature made good progress um, related to medical marijuana. I'd like to see us continue to, you know, look at that. Um, there was good progress, but you know, I understand that there's still some issues um, that could, you know, the legislature should be looking at. And you know, one of the reasons I feel so strongly about this is is it's personal. One of the um, one of the uh, diseases that is. Um, is said to be helped by uh, medical marijuana is Parkinson's disease. And uh, my mother-in-law passed away from Parkinson's several years ago, and it, it is not a pleasant disease. And um, I would have done anything to help her be more comfortable, um, especially towards the end of her life. So, you know, I think that we need to um, move past the stigma, I'm sorry, stigma associated with medical marijuana and make sure that we are, you know, fully exploring how the use of it can help um, Iowans because I really don't want to see any Iowans suffer just because we refuse to do the right thing because of some old-fashioned stigma. Karen, legislation last year passed in the Andes. Um, it prevents doctor shopping, reduces over prescribing, provides support to Iowa suffering from opioid addiction. Um, there's a lot of PMPs who are working for to make sure that people aren't over prescribing, that you know, they, they make the joke all the time that dentists are giving out a 60 day supply for you know, the toothache. That's not the right thing. We have to make sure we look at these things and look forward people aren't shopping around. This bill is one of the best bills I think we've passed. This is along with our mental health bill that my friend Shannon Lunger right behind me ran. Uh, we think it's fantastic. I think it's moving forward. Back to your point on medical marijuana. We, we took a step in the right direction, but I, full, I support a full comprehensive medical marijuana program, and we need to get there next year. Um, I think moving forward, that's one of the most important things you can do, is help with pain, help with everything else, instead of having people prescribe these dangerous pills that kill people. When it comes to opioid, this is, like most people, we have a sad story somewhere. I've graduated 420 kids. I've lost two kids from opioid and heroin overdose in my graduating class. My sister has lost one. We've lost three kids from Johnson High School who I graduated with and I had to attend their funerals for overdosing on this stuff. That is awful. Um, we need to make sure we do the best we can and get, stop this bad habit which keeps going. But we're going to keep working and hopefully medical marijuana next year we get a better build up for that. Thank you. Thanks, Shane. 
Um, just to let the candidates know, we're going to forego a couple of the prepared questions, but there's one more prepared question <laughs> that we wanted to get to for sure. And it's a pretty generic question, but I think it's something that every candidate should have to answer, and that is, we believe that public service is a very important and a high calling. What is your personal motivation for seeking this office? Well, thank you. Um, my personal motivation is I believe I can make a difference. I have believed, whether people agree with me or not, in certain policies, I have proven myself over and over again to be an effective legislator. We have more bills out of my committees that I've worked on than anybody else. And my speaker jokes all the time, she goes, you probably have one of the best assess rates moving forward. I said, well, thank you. But I'll tell you, moving forward, we to make sure I believe that we come together, find great common ground, and I'll continue to work hard. I will continue, as long as you guys keep electing me, uh, to work hard and feel passionate about what I believe. And when I don't feel that same passion, you just leave this job and retire. This is not a DC job where you make a lot of money. You make very little money, and you do it because you believe in something, and you believe in doing it because you have a higher purpose for this. Thank you so much. This is an easy question. It's, it's simply because I care. I care about the community, I care about the state, and I think I can make a difference. All right, so we're gonna, um, they sorted out and eliminated some duplicates. Um, we're gonna move to some of the questions that were submitted at the back of the room. Now I wanna make sure everybody knows there is no way we're gonna get to all those questions in there. So. <laughs> Thank you for submitting them. If you just feel very uh, um, accomplished if your question gets asked here this evening. Okay, so here's the first question. Are the recent changes in collective bargaining law something that will promote economic development? No, I do not believe that the recent changes in the collective bargaining law will promote economic development. I think that the changes in the collective bargaining law have left many of our public employees feeling uh, devalued, unappreciated, um, and a lot of these public employees have given their entire careers to you know, schools and the police force and fire departments and and um, you know, different departments of the state. And when the legislature came in in 2017 and just unilaterally stripped them of all of their collective bargaining rights, um, it was devastating for a lot of public employees. I have spoken with um, school administrators. I've spoken with um, um, you know, different city officials, and I have yet to speak with one who said that they asked the legislature to make these changes. I think we want to make sure that um, our public employees, our teachers, our police officers, our firefighters know that we value them, and we need to restore uh, the collective bargaining rights um, rather than just leave them stripped the way that the legislature left them in 2017. I think it was a great bill. I'll tell you why. One of the main reasons we have is that we were able to find the middle ground before. Before the arbitrators would come to the negotiation table, you could not take the middle ground. You had to take it one side or the other. The other thing in that bill that we did was we made it very open and public transparent why people were fired. People were fired for numerous reasons. The Moines Register for all their flaws. They did a great job weeks afterwards firing state employees for looking at pornographic uh, teachers that were uh, <laughs> talking to teachers or kids and students. That helped that we were able to fire these people instead of paying them to go away. University professors that were paid to go away because we couldn't fire them. You know what we did? We got rid of them. They should be. Um, one thing else they did, they take in merit-based pay. Merit-based pay is way better than seniority-based pay. You should not get paid by how old you are, how old you are. You should get paid by your worth and what you bring to the table and everything else. The other thing is that people don't understand when you would collect a bargain before, you couldn't take into the financial hardship of the district or whoever you're collecting bargaining with. So if you have a small town and you lose 20 students, that's $12,000 a kid, um, what are you going to do? You, you, you can't have a 4 or 5% increase in fire bunch of teachers. It would fire the, first, the youngest teachers first instead of 
who makes the most sense. So I think this is a great bill, and I'm proud to vote for it. Also, they're giving bonuses of our school districts to hard to find teachers. I think that's a great step. It gives local control back to the school district. All right, right back to you, Jake. Um, how will you make sure Iowa Medicaid is working most for those who rely on it, um, like Iowans with disabilities? Absolutely. So the Iowa Medicaid, and I'll tell you what, that's a big issue to tackle, and I think I'm really willing to work with it on anybody to make it better. Um, this was done by an executive order in 2014-15. Over the last couple of years, we have passed numerous bills to try to rein in and try to make sure people are paid on time. And so what I'm doing over the next couple of weeks is I'm meeting with different people, different providers in our district to find out what the biggest issue is. And so far, we, over the phone calls, the biggest issue is getting paid on time to make sure people are getting paid. So I'm happy to work with anybody. I'm meeting with some folks I know uh, next week and when I get back and then make sure to move forward. But right now, we have to make sure we fix the problem we have. So if there's a problem, we got to hear about it, and I'm willing to work with anybody. The bills we passed out of the House, um, passed unanimously. So happy to work on it. Thank you, Jake. Karen. Thank you. Uh, before I answer the Medicaid question, I do want to respond to um, Representative Highfield's uh, comments about Chapter 20. Uh, I disagree that Chapter 20 prohibited public employers from terminating um, low-performing employees or employees who had, um, you know, conducted misconduct. It's just, it, it's simply not the case. Uh, sure, you know, employers need to go through some work to address performance issues, but um, I think employers should um, you know, be making sure that they're addressing performance issues before they start terminating employees in any case. Um, and it also is not the case that uh, uh, arbitrators could not uh, take into uh, account economic hardship of different um, um, schools. Um, I know that arbitrators regularly take that into case when into consideration when they're considering um, different proposals for wage increases. So, just wanted to clarify that. Uh, in terms of Medicaid, um, I think you know I've heard it described as a mess, a fiasco, and those are some of the kinder. Uh, phrases I've heard to describe the Medicaid mess. You know, the fact is we moved into a privatization uh, situation um, ill-prepared for, um, for what was going to happen. Uh, providers knew that it wasn't going to work. Providers knew that it was being rushed. Uh, but we moved forward with it just because we you know, were so anxious to um, privatize uh, this public program. Uh, what we need to do is we need to get back to our priorities. We need to make sure that our priorities with Medicaid are uh, for um, uh, making sure that people receive the services that they need as opposed to making um, profits for for-profit companies. I don't think that uh, the MCOs have been successful in this state. Um, I hear story after story about appeals and uh, problems that people have had with receiving services, um, and you know, just one issue, issue after another, and that doesn't even speak to the issues that the providers have had. I'm on the board of Primary Healthcare Community Health Center. Uh, we had problems for months and months and months, and still do, uh, with getting paid by the MCOs. Uh, some of these smaller providers simply went out of business because they could no longer um, just hold out waiting to finally be paid for these MCOs. So it hurt the providers. More importantly, it's negatively impacted people uh, who need the services most, and we absolutely need to get this turned around immediately. Would you allow a mentally ill person who is on disability for being mentally ill to purchase a gun? Wow, that's a great question. Um, you know, I mean, that's pretty broad. I mean, what's the mental illness? You know, I, I don't know that, you know, based, based upon, you I'm a lawyer, based upon the facts, I'm not sure I can answer uh, that one definitively. Um, so um, let me just state a little bit more broadly that, you know, I do think that there are things we should be looking at to making sure that, you know, people who shouldn't have guns don't have guns. Uh, we have had, you know, just 
obviously way too many tragedies in this country over the last several years. And we look back and it is entirely clear that some of these shooters should never have had um, the weapons that they had access to. Uh, so I am certainly open to looking at um, different ways to ensure that you know, people don't have access to weapons if they are in the kind of condition uh, that makes it clear that they shouldn't have access to those weapons. Karen, Jake? No, that's already current law. If you're a felon, if you're mental health handicap, or any other reason you have your rights restricted, that's current law, I support it. All right. Well, I'm just watching the clock back here, and I see it's 5.55, so I would now invite, um, let's see, who did opening statement first? You did, Karen. So I'm going to have Jake do the first closing statement, um, and then um, please be uh, cognizant of time, and then Karen, you go right after Jake, okay? Again, thank you very much for coming out. I appreciate it very much. Uh, always good to talk with people and have a good open conversation. I want to thank you for six years of service. It's been an honor of a lifetime and I'm asking for two more. And I will tell you some of the things moving forward that we're going to continue with what we're going to do. We're going to continue to have open transparent records back there on the back table of my phone cards, my cell phones on there, my emails on there. If you have any quick problems, get a hold of me, please feel free. After the 5,500 doors I've knocked so far this year, um, I put up with those, every one of those doors. So I want to make sure that people have the contact information they can hear from me. And I want to make sure that we continue to watch our, our, our fiscal house going forward, that we can continue to make sure we work together and have a great state for the work, raise a family. And I want to thank you again for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much to the Johnston and Grimes Chambers for hosting this. Uh, thank you so much, Representative Highfield, for being here. Um, and thank you all for taking time out of your day to join us this afternoon. You know, it's so important that voters have an opportunity to hear the views of candidates who want to represent them in the Iowa House. Uh, and as so often happens with these kinds of events, of course, we didn't get to all of your questions um, or have an opportunity to talk uh, about the issues that are so important to district voters. We didn't have a chance to discuss the reality uh, that the economy is not booming for all Iowans, or the Me Too movement, or equal pay, or voting rights, or climate, or sports betting, which I suspect Representative Highfield might have wanted to, an opportunity to talk about a little bit. I know you spent a lot of time uh, on that issue. So I want to offer um, to you know to have another um, have another forum before um, November six. I can make any time work, um, you know, probably afternoon or um, over lunch or early evening. So if you have some availability, um, I think it would be great for us to have another one so we can cover a few more of those topics. <laughs> well, you've heard from me today uh, about my views, but you know, I've over the last year heard um, from many people in our district about their views. You know, I've met people at the doors. I've met people in homes. I've met people in community uh, gatherings. I've met people at the farmer's market. And what I've learned is that people in the district did not ask for privatized Medicaid. And they did not ask for tax breaks for the wealthy. And they did not ask to have the legislature strip away collective bargaining rights from our public school teachers and our police officers and firefighters and other public employees. They did not ask for many of the bills that were passed these past two years without debate or compromise and that were passed strictly along party lines. There is a real frustration in our community over the failure of Iowa's legislators to put aside partisanship and work together for the good of the district. Most importantly, I learned what I suspected all along, and that is that we have far more in common than what divides us. We all want to live in a safe community and have great schools. We all want to have the opportunity to earn a decent living to have a fair tax system, and to see our tax dollars spent wisely and prudently. You know, people in this district, we support our public schools. 
and our talented educators. Our parents had the foresight to make sure we received a good public school education. And this community reflects the value of that investment that they made. And we need to continue to make that investment in public education for future generations. And people in this district, we care about seniors and persons with disabilities. We Iowans, we care about each other. And none of us wants to see our neighbors live in fear that they cannot get the medical care that they need. I do not pretend to have all the answers to our health care issues. These are complex problems. But I do have the kind of background to help be part of the solution. I've worked at Broadlands, Easter Seals, Lutheran Social Service. I've served on the boards of directors of the Central Iowa AIDS Project and um, primary health care. Uh, my specialization in my master's program is in health care administration. I will work to make sure that all Iowans have access to the health care they need, including mental health services, and without being subject to limitations due to pre-existing conditions. <laughs> Finally, I've learned that people in this district want legislators who will listen. And I promise you I will listen and I will respond to you. And they want legislators who will work together to create a sensible budget that reflects our common values. And I will do that. For those of you who have already made a decision to vote for me, thank you. Your confidence is overwhelming. Um, I am humbled by your support. For those of you still deciding, I hope as you reflect on the views and the conversation we had today that you decide to cast your vote for me. I'm looking so forward to working for all of you to make sure the people in this district have a voice at the State House. Thank you so much. As we close here today, I'd like to reiterate our thanks to first and foremost the candidates for taking time out of their busy schedules to, to come and help us all learn a little bit more about how they feel about some of the issues we discussed tonight. Obviously there's so much more as was brought up that could be discussed and um, I hope you guys are able to get the answers to the questions that you have. Um, Thank you to the City of Grimes again for allowing us to use the space, helping us get set up in here. I'm not the most tech savvy person, but they have some people that were. Um, thank you for to the, those in the audience that just didn't have that much interest in a lot of the economic development questions. Thank you for allowing our organization to ask questions on behalf of our membership. Um, and then finally, thank you to the staff and thank you to everybody who attended here this evening. We hope that you're able to get out and vote on November the 6th and uh, exercise your constitutional right. So uh, I think one thing we can all agree on in this room is that we're very fortunate to be in communities that are, are very good by comparison to almost anywhere else in the world. Um, and it's a pleasure for our Chambers of Commerce to represent the members that we have here to help bring new taxable valuation to our communities and jobs so that people can can live good lives. Um, thanks again for being here, and everybody have a nice evening.